Good morning, church family. Are we on? We're on? Just out of curiosity, do we have anybody here who's been married 50 years or more? Would you raise your hand? Congratulations, yes. When we, my wife and I first got married many years ago now, uh, her mother said after about five years, well, you've got a good start on 50. And uh, come December, we will be married 47 years, and I think we have a good start on 50 <laughs> as we're going on. And that means that Jan and I have had many conversations. Uh, some of them have been light and a lot of fun, and some of them have been quite heavy and emotional and uh, tough. Most of them are just about the mundane things of life. Uh, I'm sure that you have had those kind of conversations yourself. So if I were to come home from, from work and Jan asked, you know, how was your day? I would say, as a man, fine. <laughs> what more needs to be said than that? But that's not usually a satisfactory answer for her, and that's all my blitz brain can come up with. Or, um, or maybe I say I had a really rough day, and I would say, well, that doesn't work for her either because she wants more information. Like, what does it mean to be fine? Uh, what does it mean that you had a rough day? Give me some information. So I have some options here. Uh, let's say that I have a fantastic memory, which I don't. But I begin to narrate my day for my wife, and and so I, I start out episode by episode, conversation by conversation, word by word, and I turn into this kind of a, a rushing stream of words, and it sounds like a Russian novel until she finally rolls her eyes and says, enough. That would be an option. But there's another option. I could say, fine. And then I could choose a few details, maybe stories from the day that would illustrate for her why I think it's fine. Or if my day was rough, I could do the same thing. I could pick out a few things and say, blah, 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 and then she would say, oh, I see why your, your day was rough. Um, so if, if I came home and I said, you know, a, it was a great day, it was fine, and, and then she would want more, and I'd say, well, I taught a class today and the students were exceptionally motivated and involved with it and I saw light bulbs going off in the classroom. It was cool. It was a good day to be a professor. And she would get the idea. And if it was a bad day, and I could say something like, well, I was grading papers today and I found a paper that was heavily plagiarized. I hate plagiarism. It, it means that, that I have to have a conversation with a student. I have to give them an F for the assignment. I have to report it to the administration. It's just a bad day. And on top of that, we had an academic meeting. Oh, they're lovely. <laughs> academic meetings. So you, you get the idea that we could choose episodes and order them in such a way that my wife would come away knowing that my day was fine or rough based on the stories that I chose to tell her. Now, you all do the same thing. You, you don't come home and tell your other, every little detail of every little thing that you have done. You choose a few things and then it's illustrated. Now, the wives are a little bit different. I know that you could, <laughs> we, we won't go there. Um, what I want to say, though, is, is that very technique is the same one that the, the, the authors of the scriptures use. So when we're talking about biblical narratives like we are in the book of Acts, the author Luke had many different things that he could choose from, but he chose certain stories and ordered them and placed them in such a way that he's trying to make a point. Now, it's up to us when we read the text to be thinking through why this person, why in this place, why this discussion, what is the author trying to get us to understand by these, the selection of these items and putting them in this order? So Luke does that in the book of Acts. 
And we're going to be in Acts chapter 16 this morning. Uh, If you want to turn in your Bibles there, we will be uh, starting at verse 11. And if the men would, men or whoever is here, would pass out the Bibles. These Bibles are for your use while here in the church. And if you don't have a Bible at home, we want to give one to you. Uh, Take it home. uh, Read it. Get involved with it. It's a, it's a great, a great uh, book of God's word. So what author, what we have here in Luke 16 is that Luke takes three people and he, he kind of paints little pictures of these three people in order to make a point. Now, last week, Todd Pito got us started on the chapter and he talked about a character named Lydia uh, he was, was talking about this woman who was the very first convert in Europe, um, and he went through a lot of things, and I, I listened to it on the tape. We were in Colorado in the smoke of all of the fires last weekend, so that's good to be back where the air is clear, but smoggy, <laughs> a little, little swampy around here. Uh, so we, he decided, we decided long ago that he would talk about Lydia, and I would talk about Roman culture and the town of Philippi. We'll get there. Um, And it's not going to be the whole sermon about those things, but those things are important. And Todd skipped over them uh, for my benefit. So I I don't want to duplicate his work, but I I do want to, uh, let's say, let's let's review a little bit about Lydia. What do we know about her? She was a religious Gentile. She worshipped God in the manner of the Jews. She went to the synagogue. She was a businesswoman. Uh, she was probably a woman who had some means, wealth maybe, because she, she had a house that was big enough for worship. And we also see in the text that God opened her heart to the gospel, and as a result, this was the base for ministry in Philippi and into the rest of Europe. Uh, she was the first convert. Important to keep that in mind. So what is it that we should notice about Lydia? Just kind of put it in the back of our minds as we, be, as we go through She is a she. That's important. Lydia's a woman. And you're going, what? Why is that important? Because she's the first character in Europe who came to Christ. She is highlighted in this first section when Romans and women in Rome were not venerated. To have her as the first witness is a little unusual. So this was contra Roman culture. It could have been some guy, but Luke didn't pick a guy. God didn't pick a guy. God picked a woman, and she's the first one in Europe, and God opened her heart to the gospel. She was associated with the Jewish synagogue. She was wealthy. She was socially connected. She heard the gospel. She believed, was baptized, and then she began to serve others. There's a pattern here. Now, surprisingly, we don't hear anything else about Lydia in the rest of Acts. And we don't find her name in the letter to Philippi, the Philippians either. She drops out of the story. But for now, we have what we need. Lydia was what? A woman, a Gentile. She was converted to Christ. She was first, and she was eager to serve. That's what we need to know. And her inclusion and her placement at the beginning of the narrative is a bit of a surprise. Now the next person in the narrative is even more of a surprise. It's a demon-possessed girl. We find our next person in verse 16, and we're going to read it. As we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune-telling. She followed Paul and us, crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. Now, Remember that I said Luke picks some things and highlights them and leaves other things out. He, there are lots of contacts that Paul has been having in Philippi. He's been in the synagogue. He's been in different places. So he could have chosen a, a lot of different people. But right here, Luke chooses Lydia and tells us her story. 
he, he fronts another woman entirely from, a different, from an entirely different background. He places two women next to each other in the text so that we can compare. Not only does, the, does he order things, but also in narratives, there are subtle ways that the author is trying to invite us to join in and to imagine in our minds what is going on and to, to enter into the activity, to relive it so to speak. So we want to try to do that a little bit th this morning. And, and so this next act, we have this setting. Paul and his helpers are often going to a place of prayer. Now, it's hard to Im imagine, you know, we're sitting here in our place of prayer. Uh, place of prayer, by the way, was the Greek way of, of, of saying synagogue. <laughs> he, he was headed towards the synagogue. Um, and, and so they were headed towards the, the synagogue, and, and we have this place of prayer, and I have a slide up here somewhere with a stream on it. There we go. This slide, it shows a stream, the stream that's closest to Philippi. So they're, they're headed out of the city to a place near water. This is the closest stream that's there where there is water. Can you, get, can you start to get into your picture? You're walking towards this place. So we're, we're, we're entering into what's going on. So we're, we're on this path, we're walking, we're a group of people, we're chatting about whatever's going on. Um, nice day, isn't it? You know how, what you do when you're, you're, you're talking. Um, I wonder how many are gonna be at synagogue today. I wonder what passage we're gonna be talking about. Uh, in a, you know, I wonder, maybe we should pray a little bit on the way and see if God will open some hearts today. Uh, according to the word. and So this is the sort of thing, just a common, ordinary conversation. They're on their way to this place. We don't know whether it was in a building or in a place just like, like this, but the water was there so that they could do their purification rites. So they're walking along, minding their own business, conversing quietly, and a girl joins them and then starts to shout. <laughs> Sorry. Um... She causes a scene every time they go to the place of prayer. And the Greek word crying out is used elsewhere of, of loud pleading, loud shouting. Sometimes it's used by desperate people who are trying to get attention. It's, it's not a quiet word. Matthew used it of two blind guys who are saying, Lord, have mercy on us. Son of David, they wanted to see you again. That's loud, and when people told them to shut up, they got louder. Lord, have mercy on us. Sometimes it's used of demonized people. Remember the story of Legion who had a thousand demons, and he cried out too, <laughs> cried out, it says, with a loud voice, Lord, what have you do to do with me, son of the most high God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. It's the same expression that Jesus used on the cross. He cried out, with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Do, do you get the, the idea you're walking along? How would you like it if you're walking down the street in Yardley? Just minding your own business. And somebody comes up and starts shouting at you every time you go to Wawa. Somebody's shouting at you. And the text says that this happened many days. Many days. Paul was in, in Philippi, and every time he went to the synagogue, and this woman shows up. That would get annoying, you think? So we begin to have a plot that, that's forming here. We, we have this crisis. They're on their way. This woman is shouting, what's Paul going to do? How is he going to handle this distraction? How will he treat her? It makes you wonder who this woman might be. I wish we knew more about her. The text gives us some hints, but it doesn't give us everything that we would like to know. She was a slave. We know that. She was someone else's property. She had no rights of her own. She was a tool in the hands of her masters. In other words, the woman was being taken advantage of. 
Second, the text says that she had a spirit of divination. Literally in the text it says she had a python spirit. I don't know if you, it doesn't have that in the ESV, but that's what's in the Greek. A python spirit. And, and here Luke is kind of alluding to something in Greek mythology where you have uh, this great huge serpent that, that guarded the city of Delphi, which was in the Greek consideration the center of the world. And according to, to legend, Apollo descended to Olympus and in order to select his site for where he wanted to have his shrine and all of this stuff, he had to kill this big serpent and the serpent's name was Python. He killed it and it was laid there to rot. And Python means rot. So that's kind of what's going on here. And, and so we, we have this idea of this girl who has a spirit of the oracle, the, the, the Delphi, she, she has something. To put it bluntly, she was a demon-possessed woman who had a gift for telling the future. That's what's going on here. The third thing we see about her was that she was really good with what she did. She made excellent money. Well, we don't know whether it was truthful or not, but at least she made excellent money uh, for her owners. She was strongly, you know, they had this portfolio and uh, she was uh, coming back really good on that investment and, and it was great. And yet she's relentlessly given forth this message. These men are servants of the Most High God You must, you, to, who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And that sounds pretty good, doesn't it? She's telling everybody. Well, it, it is and it isn't. You think about it, her message is true, maybe. But it would be like Adolf Hitler saying Billy Graham was a great evangelist. You think about that, the message is true, but the messenger kind of gives you pause about whether you want to believe it or not. So, so here you have this girl, this well-known mantic, saying, these guys worship and serve God. Wow, that's a great testimony. And then there's another problem with this statement that we, is not obvious to us. And that is this, that the Most High God to a pagan in that time could have been Zeus on the highest mountain in the world. So to a pagan to listen to this phrase, it's like, yeah, yeah, our, our Zeus is that. And to a Jew, they would be saying, no, 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 that's our God, the God of the Old Testament. And then she talks about salvation too, and it's the same sort of, of ambiguity that's, that's there, is, is that, you know, if it were a Jew, they say, well, there's one path, the God of the Bible. But to a pagan culture where you have all kinds of gods, it's one of many paths. So you have this ambiguity that's coming from this woman. For whatever reason, Paul got annoyed, super annoyed. The word's not very used very often here in the text. It's a strong word. God on his last nerve pushed his buttons, brought him to the boiling point. That's, that's sort of what, we're, what we have going on here. Um, I have to admit, I'm getting older. Um, my dad had a 1958 Chevy station wagon when I was growing up, brand new. So I think I was five years old maybe at that time. We, we were traveling across country in the station wagon and there were three of us siblings in the back. And in those days, we didn't worry about seat belts. I'm not even sure they were in the car. Um, you know, the, the back part of the station wagon was down and the three kids were back in the back, you know, making noise, wrestling around, all of that kind of stuff. And my dad got annoyed. He's fairly patient, but he got annoyed. And uh, he warned us to knock it off or else. You would never do that with your kids. You've never had it done to you, I'm sure, knock it off or else. Well, we didn't listen. And the or else was that we stopped in the middle of some place in the Midwest where there was next to a cornfield, and one by one, we went down a row in the cornfield for an attitude adjustment. <laughs> and when we came back, the car was quiet. We had gotten on my dad's last nerve. That's kind of what's going on here in this passage is this woman has been doing all of this sort of stuff, and Paul finally has enough and says, okay, right, demon, out of here. And it came out. 
Are you there with us? I mean, you, you've got all this picture of the stuff in the, in the background. Again, I wish we knew more about this woman. We don't know her name. We don't know what her owners did with her when she could no longer fill their pockets. We don't even know whether she was converted to Christ. A few commentators think so, and I lean in that direction uh, myself, but the text doesn't explicitly tell us that. God delivered her from this demon And in my thinking, I'm going, if Jesus delivered this woman, would he leave her to return to that way of life? And so I'm going to go with, I think that this is one of those encounters where God delivered her from that demon and she was converted. If that's the case, then we are beginning to see evidence that the gospel is for everyone. Lydia, the social person, The demon-possessed girl, different place in life, same gospel for different people. Two women from different stratas of society, and they need the same Jesus, Lydia and this servant girl. This is the power of the gospel. It's for everyone. So at this point, we have this big buildup the servant girl and everything goes down, but she drops out of the story. We don't know anything more about her. We would like to know more, but we aren't given any more. Instead, we move on to the next section, and we see, again, a pattern that's going on that Luke is doing in this narrative. Lydia, slave girl. Next section is sort of a segue section. And, and we're, we're going to have a, this background that was given. We're going to have some rising action and the tension that's going on, and we're going to get to a climax and resolution. And it's all in here. Let's, let's read it beginning. I don't know what word it is, but when, your own, but when her owners, there we go. Ah, notice, you got some yellow things up there. Leave this one up for a while. We'll come back to it. But when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, these men are Jews and they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in attacking them and the magistrates tore the garments off of them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in in the stocks. Whoa. Their lucrative business, <laughs> not a good thing anymore. They, they just lost their money, money ticket. Economic depression in Philippi, Philippi style. So what did they do? They took legal action, but they did a devious thing. Their complaint was not truthfully stated in financial terms. Hey, we're really mad because we lost our income. What they did is they stated in ethnic terms, these men are Jews. There we go. The Romans had a long and contentious history with the Jewish people in 53 AD. You remember from your history, Emperor Claudius and all of those boys, you know, back there and Julius Caesar and Brutus and Cassius and, well, I know that was ninth grade, but it's a long time ago. Um, the letter to the Philippians was written between 50 and 53, and it was during this time of persecution. So Paul is there right on the fringe of these things that are, that are going on. And, and so the Jews are not seen in good light. And the second thing that's happened is that Paul and his friends are proselytizing to the Christian faith. And the Romans have said, no proselytizing. Why? Because it has disturbs the peace of Rome. Now, that law was not normally followed, but in this case, we're going to hang on to anything we can, right? They're Jews, and they're making a mess of our city. And so we have problems. Now, here's where we need to stop and talk about Philippi. We need to talk about the background here. It's described in verse 12, last week's sermon, as a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. 
Now, what exactly does that mean? What difference does it make in our story to know some geographic and cultural background? Oh, there's a map. You're getting used to maps. <laughs> over here on my right, and I don't know how I could do this. <laughs> we'll stick over here. You see Philippi on the right there. There's a little town called Neapolis. About 10 miles from Neapolis is Philippi. It's too small. But Neapolis was a port city. Philippi was a major city. This is where it is. And then you'll see uh, on the next slide, if you put that up. There we go. You see the red line there? That's Highway I-95. From Constantinople to the Adriatic Sea, they'd hop a boat and then they would go over to Italy. And so this place, and where the yellow arrow is, is where Philippi is about located. Philippi was on this major highway between these two places. Not only that, but if you can see from the geography, there are mountains surrounding Philippi, and it was a gold mining area, very rich area. So Philippi had become an important place uh, in, in Macedonia. Not only that, but there had been two battles that had been fought there among the Romans, and Brutus and Cassius were uh, destroyed in these battles. They were the ones who murdered Julius Caesar. Uh, well, that's another story. Um, but what happened was after those battles, Philippi came a place where these soldiers were settled and it became a Roman colony. Well, so what? You can live in a Roman colony, but Roman colonies had certain privileges that I think that you would like if you were a Roman citizen. Um, it had equal status with cities in Italy. Ooh, that sounds pretty good. Um, your property would never be taxed. Any sign up for that one? All right. And then you could never be put in chains and beaten without a formal trial. Those are the privileges of a Roman citizen. In, in other words, to be a Roman citizen in a Roman place like Philippi was to have the golden ticket. You know, we're, we're sitting good with this. And what do we know? Paul was a Roman citizen. And he was protected by Roman law. But things didn't play out that way. And we don't know why Paul declined to declare his citizenship when he was arrested. I'm sure he had his reasons. What we do know is that it served God's purposes. See, these stories, when we're talking about narratives, God is always a character in the background. What is God doing? Now, I don't know... If we can go back to the slide that had the, the yellow marks on it, that would be, there we go. Look, look at some of these words up here. Short paragraph, but what, what Luke does is he piles on words, and he does it for effect. Disturbing, not lawful, attacking, tore, beat, many blows, through, inner prison, stocks, do you see how highlighting those words kind of brings it out? This was not something that was little and small and mild. It was violent. It was mean. It was unjust. Luke used those words to just draw our attention to this. Not a minor scolding. This was complete humiliation and torture. Just think about the word beating. I could, we could do a lot of those up here, but beating. Josh McDowell says this. The criminal was usually stripped of his clothes. I had a picture of a guy hanging there stripped of his clothes, but not for church. And he was beaten by somebody called lictors or scourgers. The Hebrews limited their scourging to 40, 40 lashes. You've probably seen run across that, but usually they would do 39, so if they miscounted, they wouldn't blow it. Not so the Romans. They had no limitations. As many as you feel like. Think, okay, well, let's go on to a slide that has lictors up here. There we go. 
Aren't these look guys nice? See over here on the right-hand side, you have these rods, and then you have an ax in the middle. They carried these around. These are like the policemen. So they had these rods, and they had the ax. The ax was for corporal punishment, the rods for, uh, for beatings. Next slide. You think, I don't know anything about this stuff. Ever looked at the back of one of your dimes? There it is. There are the rods. There is the ax. It's, it's, it's a symbol of authority. And these men would carry these things around with the magistrates, and when it was time to beat somebody, they would tie them up, take these rods out, and beat them half to death. Wow. Are you, are you getting a better picture of what's going on here in Philippi? Let's go to the next slide. This is what is considered to be the traditional site of the, the prison in Philippi. This is the outside. We have a next slide, which is the inside. Doesn't this look like a neat place to be? Hang out, sanitized and all. Next slide. And then they put them in stocks. They put their feet in stocks so that they couldn't move around, they couldn't wiggle. Very uncomfortable. So if, if you can just imagine this, this picture, these two guys there, Paul's half, is undressed. He's got welts all over his back, bleeding probably, and he's leaning up against one of these stone walls. What would you expect Paul to be doing? Well, probably whimpering, moaning. But what do we see? What we see in this next scene is that Paul is praying. Paul is singing. I can't imagine having a hymn sing in prison in the middle of the night after being beaten and put in stocks. That seems a little bit out of, of order, but then remember, have we ever seen any imprisonments before in the book of Acts? Has God ever done anything before when it comes to prison? And we have this motif going through here that's saying, wow, what did God do in prison? Well, Peter got in prison, and uh, God got him out. Peter got in prison again, and God got him out. And now we're, we're sitting here thinking, well, what's going to happen? How will God redeem this situation? Can we anticipate deliverance? Is God going to do something based on what we've already seen in the book of Acts? Well, let's read 25 to 34. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them, and suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bonds were unfastened, the jailer woke, saw the prison, and etc. We'll go on down. And they spoke the word of the Lord to them in all his house. He took them the same hour of the night, washed their wounds, baptized them at once, he and his family, and he brought them into his house and set food before him. And he rejoiced along with his entire household that he believed in God. Wait a minute. Praying and singing. Nothing was going right for them. But God had something in mind. The events of the slave girl, the, cast, the, the, the hardness of the, of the magistrates put them in jail. And God was going to do something, and these men were physically in pain, but spiritually they were satisfied. Why were they there? Why is this ordered this way? Because God had somebody in a, Philipp a, a, a prison in Philippi who needed a divine appointment, someone who needed to hear the gospel, and he took his messengers to him to share the gospel. A timely earthquake freed them from prison. A timely message frees the prison keeper. It's a beautiful story. So if I speed things up here as I'm looking at the clock back there, um, we think that this was a re retired uh, soldier. Um, he knew that he had blown it. The prisoners were probably gone. He'd lose his life, so he was willing to take his own. He, he saw his deep need, and then he comes with a question that everybody has to ask. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? That's a good question. And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved and your household. 
Can you think about it? What was the likelihood of this man hearing the gospel if Paul had not delivered a demonic, uh, a demon-possessed girl and been treated unjustly by the magistrates? God works in mysterious ways, and he took Paul and he took Silas where they needed to be through means that were not pleasant. What we think may be bad indeed may serve God's purposes for good. He may use our uncomfortable circumstances to advance his gospel work. His timely interventions accomplish his purposes. So the text is fascinating, isn't it? Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Isn't that a good question for all of us? What must I do to be saved? And some people answer that, well, go to church. It's a good start, but that's not it. Go to church and tithe. Well, good start, that's not it. Go to church and do a lot of good works, and at the end, God will count them all up and you'll be in. Not a good answer. What does this text say? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. That's it. Nothing added. Pure gospel. That's it. Most of us have been exposed to the message of the gospel previously. We know that we have sinned. We know that we have fallen short of the glory of God. We know that God sent his son to pay the penalty for every sin that we have ever committed or ever will commit. We know that God loved us and gave his son for us, and all he says is believe. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. Believe, act upon it. Now, do you see our three characters? Lydia, what? Believe, be saved. Slave girl. There's no belief involved, but Jesus in his mercy and power liberated her from her demonic oppression. And then we have this prisoner. Believe and be saved. Wow. Three different people lined up in our text to make one point. The gospel is for everyone. You see how he's done that? Now, there's one more paragraph. And it's in verse, beginning in verse 35. And I'll just tell the story rather than read it. Paul's in trouble. He gets beaten. He's put in prison in the stocks. The next day, the magistrates say, well, I don't know why we did that. Let's let him go. And so they come quietly and say, okay, tell Paul he can go. And Paul says, no, I am a Roman citizen. Oh, no, now you know why I talked about Roman citizenship. I am a Roman citizen. I have been beaten and humiliated publicly. Now you're going to apologize publicly. See, their rights were denied. Why were they denied? Why were they willing to take this beating? Because God had a divine appointment for a prison keeper who needed to hear the gospel and respond to it. Paul suffered as a citizen of heaven. Paul protected the church as a citizen of Rome. When he had them come and apologize, now there's credibility for the church that's just gotten started in Europe. And they are more reluctant to touch them. (laughs) They're they're not going to mess with them anymore. So we've got these four characters. They all go together. Luke stuck them in such a way that we can see what's going on. And now I want to go back, and let's just talk about some application points, some things to think about. Quick, one. The gospel is for everyone. Is that easy to remember? The gospel is for everyone, rich and poor, connected or not, secular or religious, male or female. It doesn't matter. The gospel is for everyone. All people matter to Christ, and they should matter to us as well. 
the ones sometimes we deem the furthest away from the truth are still not outside the reach of the gospel. Maybe you have some people in your life that you're praying for and you want to see them come to Christ in the worst way, a colleague, a friend, a family member, and you're saying, it's impossible. We don't know that, do we? We don't know that. Keep praying. Keep sharing. Keep living the life. Christ's power can heal the most broken of people, and we are just his messengers. Second, God leads gospel workers to divine appointments and vice versa. I want you to think about that. Maybe we haven't had an opportunity to witness recently. Maybe it's because we need to open our eyes. Maybe God has led people to us or us to people that we could share the gospel with, but we're just not open to it. And it would be a good time for us to pray, Lord, open my eyes to the opportunities. Who do you want me to share the gospel with? There's a divine appointment somewhere in my life, and I know it. He leads us to divine appointments. Lydia was in a synagogue. The girl was on a street. The guy was in a prison, and God took his messenger where they needed to be so that they could hear this message of God. Be open. Look for those opportunities. And one last thing, the gospel is simple. So I don't know how to share the gospel. What did it say? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. You need any more than that? I don't think I need a theological degree to say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. The gospel is simple and it is for you. I don't know everybody here. I, I, I don't know where your heart's at. Some of you have known the Lord for a long time and, and hopefully this will be just a reminder that we have work to do. We are here to advance the gospel by making disciples who make disciples. Have you heard that anywhere? That's what we're here to do. But you may be here and you're just at this point exploring Christianity. The gospel is for you as well. It's simple. It's clear. Broken the law, out of sorts with God, believe and be saved. I can't think of a better time than right now. Just to acknowledge to God I am a sinner and I need your help. In the end, what is Luke doing with these three characters and then Paul? He's simply saying, the church advances. How? By sharing the simple gospel with whomever God gives us an opportunity. Let's look for those opportunities. Let's pray. Lord, the gospel is beautiful and so many people have never heard what you've done for them yet even as Jeremy reported about the soccer camp this week, there were students there who had never heard of Jesus, never heard of the gospel. They're all around us. Show us opportunities to share your story. Open our eyes to who you, uh, who you would have us to share your word with. Give us boldness to open our mouths and declare your wondrous story. Amen.